All right, now we're gonna talk about fluid mechanics. So fluid mechanics describes the motions of, fl of fluids. We're gonna start by defining what we mean by a fluid. There are three main phases of matter that uh, you will mainly encounter in, uh, in an introductory physics class. There's also something called a plasma, but we're not gonna worry about that right now. Um, so that's a solid, a liquid, and a gas. And you've probably heard of these and have some sense about what we mean by that, but we're gonna be a little bit more precise. A solid um, is something where objects are pretty much, the, where the atoms and molecules are pretty much fixed inside the solid. Now they do actually vibrate around from relative to their nominal positions, but they mostly don't travel much farther than, uh, than the atomic radius. They're pretty much fixed in a, in a solid, in one spot. Okay, and then you have a liquid. In a liquid, you also, you still have the atoms and molecules close together, and the interactions between them are quite strong, but they're not fixed. They can move relative to each other. So any given molecule of water in a glass of water has a lot of interactions with many other molecules, but exactly which molecules changes because the molecules are moving inside of the liquid. Um, and then finally, you have a gas. Um, and, and, uh, and I should say here, the the distances are still a pro where the distances are a, between molecules are approximately the size of the molecules, but they're no longer fixed within that size. Their size they're moving. Um, and finally, you have a gas. And for a gas, um, when you have a gas, you have the separation between atoms and molecules in the gas is large compared to the size of those um, atoms and molecules. And we're talking by like more than a thousand times the size of, a, of the gas molecule in most cases. So a gas is very diffuse. There are interactions between the individual um, atoms or molecules in a gas, but for mo most applications, we can neglect them. They are negligible compared to other possible forces. So what we're talking about here when we describe fluid mechanics um, can help us describe the motion of liquids and gases. It does not describe solids, but it can describe both liquids and gases. And you're probably used to thinking about a liquid as a fluid, but actually gases are also fluids. When we start quantifying the properties of fluids, we need to define the density. You already have some, you probably have some intuitive sense for the density, but in physics, we have to define exactly what we mean so that we can start talking about what that means quantitatively. So the density, which is usually denoted by the Greek letter rho, is the mass divided by the volume. Um, or at least this is mostly what people mean by density. You can also have something like a number density, but this is the, the mass density, which is what people usually mean when they say density. The SI units for this are kilograms per meter cubed. A good number to have at the tip of your fingers is that the density of water is one gram per centimeter cubed. Now this is not the SI units. I admit this is the one that sticks in my head because it's a lot easier to remember one um, than it is to remember the SI version, which is 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. So this is a useful number because we often, you know, we often want to know the density of something relative to water. Water is a very dense liquid. Most liquids are less dense than water. Um, and people are approximately all water. So, you know, anytime you have, if you want to estimate the density of a person, water is not a bad place to start. Um, and you also can, you're often wondering things like, does this float? Um, so, if you have, for instance, a block, of what you already know about density, if you have a block of metal, metal has greater mass per unit volume. It is more dense than something like wood or styrofoam. So, and metal is more dense than water. So if you dump metal, a chunk of metal in a fish tank, it's gonna sink. Wood is less dense than water. If you put it in a fish tank, it's gonna float. Styrofoam is also less dense than water. If you put it in a fish tank, it's gonna float. Um, so then um, what, if you're considering a fluid, it is possible for the density of a fluid to vary with position. 
In many cases that we're going to see in this class, the density does not depend on the position, but it is at least in principle possible. When you're talking about, a, say, a glass of, of water, you usually do not have a changing density depending on the position. Um, now, of course, liquids are incompressible, meaning that you more or less cannot change their volume by pushing on them. However, we're talking about all fluids. Um, so if you talk about a gas, it actually turns out that the gas on the Earth, uh, the, in the atmosphere on the Earth, does have a density which varies with height. Um, and that's because more or less gravity is pulling the gas down. So there's more gas closer to the surface of the Earth, per unit volume closer to the surface of the Earth than up high in the sky. So when you are, say, flying on an airplane, there is less air um, per unit volume, there's less gas per unit volume, the pressure decreases. If you've been on an airplane, you know this already. You also can get these slight variations in density if you have a liquid. Um, a classic example is if you have a cup and you fill it halfway with water and halfway with oil. Water and oil do not mix, so the oil is going to tend to sit on the top. And we often want to know the density of object. Um, the density of objects often comes up when we're talking about fluid dynamics. Now, pressure. We need to know the mathematical definition of pressure, which is the force per unit area. Um, so this is a way of quantifying uh, how hard so you're, you're pushing, not just how hard you're pushing on something, the force, but you know, how, you know, how concentrated is that force. Uh, because if you have a greater, if you apply a greater pressure, it's more likely that you can damage things, whereas the overall force doesn't necessarily matter as much. So, for example, if you get poked with a finger, um, you're not necessarily going to, you know, it might be annoying, but it's not going to, going to necessarily hurt you, whereas if you get poked with a needle with the same amount of force, then the needle is more likely to go in. The needle is smaller. But, so if the force is the same, the pressure is greater. We can also talk about the pressure in a fluid, and this says rho. This actually should say P because this is the, is the pressure in a fluid. And it turns out that the pressure in the fluid depends on the height um, because as you, the, the height of the fluid above you. As you go down lower in the fluid, you have more fluid above you. And gravity acts on that fluid. So the more fluid above you, the more fluid is being pulled down uh, uh, by gravity towards you. So if we have, um, if we have, for instance, a cylindrical vessel of a liquid, and let's just say water for simplicity, um, and you want to calculate the pressure depending on um, where you are um, in that container. So the pressure is going to be the force per unit area. The force is mg, and then in this area is going, we'll just leave the area A. Now, how, what is the mass of that water? The mass of that water is the density times the volume. So rho, uh, rho g, um, Rho times the volume times the gravitational constant divided by the area. Now the, um, I believe, yeah. So then we have, this is, so we have the mass and then volume is, this actually should have rho. My equations have mistakes. The, the, um, Density times the volume, which is the area times the height times G over A. So we are left with the pressure equals the density times the height times the gravitational constant. So the greater the height of fluid above you, the more pressure you are under. This, uh, this comes into play, for instance, when you talk about um, when you talk about scuba divers going down in the ocean, because in that case, the density of water is pretty high. 
So uh, the further you go down, if you have, we'll draw the surface of the ocean. And if you go way down in the surface in your little scuba suit, that's my attempt to draw a scuba diver. So the further down you are, the greater the pressure that you, um, that you encounter. And let's just do a quick little calculation um, and see how far you have to go um, for the pressure from water to be equal to the pressure um, from the atmosphere. So another good number to have at the tips of your fingers is that the um, pressure, the atmospheric pressure on the Earth is about 10 to the fifth pascals. So pressure, um, the SI units of pressure, because this is force per unit area, it's newtons per meter squared. Um, and newtons are kilogram meters per second squared. So this is the same thing as kilograms per meter second squared. Kind of a funny unit. We call it the Pascal. So atmospheric pressure is approximately one Pascal, or sorry, 10 to the fifth Pascal. Um, specifically, I mean, actually, it's, if you want to be more precise, 1.01 times 10 to the fifth Pascal. Um, we call uh, one bar 10, is 10 to the fifth Pascal. Um, so we often use this as an alternative to an atmosphere. Um, we also will measure the atmospheric pressure in atmospheres. Um, that atm an atmosphere is the atmospheric pressure at sea level at standard temperature. Um, so these are all different units, different amounts of pressure that it's very useful to have on the tips of your fingers for uh, for any calculations. So now let's ask, how deep do you have to go in order to get an additional pressure of one bar? And so if we solve this for the height, the height is equal to the pressure divided by the density times the gravitational constant. So the height you would have to go, 10 to the fifth Pascals, and then 10 to the third kilograms per um, meter cubed. Let me go ahead and write Pascals as kilogram, uh, kilogram meters per second squared divided by meters squared, so kilograms per second squared meter, and then 9.8 meters per second squared. So now, and I put the units up so that you can get practice tracking your units, and we have the second squared canceling out here. Uh, we have two of the, the meters canceling out and our kilograms cancel out. And then we have one over, one over meters or meters. Now, 10 to the fifth divided by 10 to the third times 10 is about 10. So if you go 10 meters down, you get one atmosphere of pressure. If you go, tw so, that's actually not that deep. Um, so as you go down in the ocean, you pretty quickly reach um, several atmospheres of pressure. Um, and then you have to worry about this if you're scuba diving because your body does not re respond to those pressures very well. In fact, if you're a scuba diver, um, if you go up or down too, too quickly, you can get something called the bends, which is when uh, the, your body doesn't have time to re respond to the changes in pressure fast enough, and you can actually get gas bubbles in your bloodstream um, because of the change in the pressure. 
Okay. So then you, ha you can consider cases like this where you have a dam, and if you, you want to build a dam, now at the very top, so the, the, the force experienced by the dam is equal to the, uh, the pressure times the area. Your pressure changes here, and your pressure is greater at the bottom than at the top. Um, so, um, so because your, your pressure is given by the height uh, of water above where you are times the density times the gravitational constant. So the greater you go, the deeper you go, the more pressure this is under. That means that you actually have to build your dam to be wider at the bottom than at the top because the, there's a greater force on this part of the dam than there is up here. And you have a, there's a few problems about that in the back of your book. Um, and here you can take that, here you can see that little cylinder of fluid that we considered. And uh, you can think about what happens in the middle of the fluid by, you know, draw a little tiny um, disc in the middle of the, of the fluid. If you want to think about it, imagine that you have a little sheet of paper somewhere stuck between uh, your or sheet of aluminum foil between your oil and your water, um, or whatever liquid you've got. You've got something between there. What is the force um, that acts um, when you are, so the, sh the force experienced by that little disc is going to be the, um, the density, so our net force is going to be the density of that fluid times the area of the fluid, so this gets, this has units of, um, sorry, this is going to be the density times the mass of the fluid, which is the, um, the area times the height. Um, that's the amount of mass, and then times G. And then you get that the pressure, so the, the pressure is the force per unit area, rho G. H. And if you think about the free body diagram on um, any, on say that disc, you have um, the you have the pressure from the um, you have the mass of the fluid above, um, and then you have the uh, you have some pressure in the fluid below. Um, and then you have the mass of the disk itself. So if you think about each little, um, but I, th I think, I like to think of it like this. You, this is your mass of fluid above, and then um, the force is mg. So you get different pressures depending on how deep you are. And what you will see is that if you have flow, fluid, which can readily flow between different parts of a container, so this is designed so that this bottom part connects everything, and then there's different widths and shapes, and at all points, the fluid, um, the fluid um, rises to the same height in each column. Um, and it does that because it moves around until the pressure is equal. If there's a difference in pressure at the top of the fluid between say, this part and that part, then the fluid is going to get, um, in the higher part, it's going to get pushed down. Um, so the, the height of the column actually changes. And then we can move to Pascal's principle. Pascal's principle says that within a given fluid, um, if, if you've got everything connected, the force per unit area or the pressure is the same. So then we can look at different types of apparatuses. So here you have a hydraulic system with two fluid-filled cylinders. Um, and then you put a piston on. So this is, you can have a piston which moves the, um, which pushes up or down. So if you push down, if you have one cylinder with a smaller area and one cylinder with a larger area, um, because the pressure here has to equal the pressure there, um, if you push down on this cylinder, then uh, the force, you can even solve for force two, force two is equal to uh, A1 over A2 times force one. So if A1 
is less than A2, then this ratio is less than 1. And let's see. Yes, A1 is less than A2. The, the force on 2 will be less. All right. Let's see. So force, if A2 is smaller, I did this wrong. We have to start with this equation. I put my forces on the wrong spot. F2 is equal to A2 over A1, F1. Now, if A1 is smaller than A2, then this this is greater than 1, and the force at 2 is greater than the force at 1. And you can use the same principle here. Um, if you, uh, so you apply a smaller force to, you apply a smaller force over here, larger area over here, and it is going to push, it, it, there's going to be a greater force up on this side, which is how you can actually get a um, hydraulic jack to push a car up. Uh, in hydraulic brakes, you push on the brake pedal um, and you again have uh, different areas acting on different parts. So the force is greater in order to be able to stop the, uh, to stop the wheel. We can, all, we can move to Bernoulli's equation. Bernoulli's equation is derived from conservation, or can be derived from the conservation of energy. Um, and it takes this form where you have some constant um, from the pressure. Um, so you have pressure here. And then this is from the kinetic energy, 1 half the density times the velocity squared. This goes like mv squared. Um, and then this is. This is similar to your. Um, this is similar to your potential energy term, and what Bernoulli's equation says is that this term is constant within a fluid. Um, so that if you have, if you're considering different parts of a fluid, um, you can set. Uh, you can use Bernoulli's equation. Usually, in the applications that we actually have, what you do is that you set. Uh, you can set things. There's a lot of stuff that's constant. OK, so we can move. We move to where we can consider how um, we apply this to different scenarios. So for instance, a uh, um, manometer has one side open. An open tube manometer has one side open to the atmosphere. Um, the fluid depth will be the same on both sides. Um, or, uh, or else there will be a pressure that will equalize the pressures. Uh, and then if you add something, um, so you may want to, say, chain, check, or check the pressure over here or watch the changing pressure, um, you, can, uh, you can measure the change in pressure between two different things. Now, what this is, so we can use Bernoulli's equation, and we are going to compare this part, I'm going to call this 1. This side is 1. And this side right here is going to be 2. Now, we want to measure the difference in pressure um, on this side. Now, it's the side connected to this fluid. So this is our pressure 2. Um, and we have P1 plus 1 half rho V squared plus rho GY. And then here, I do not have the, well, we'll just put ones equals the exact same thing, but with twos. All right, now we 
do not have different, we don't have the, um, the fluid is not moving. So we're not considering a moving fluid, so our velocities are equal to zero in both cases. Uh, we only have one liquid, so I am going to cancel out the subscripts on the density because the density does not matter. And then you get that P1 minus P2. What I'm going to do is move my pressure here and move my height there. P1 minus P2 equals rho g y2 minus y1. What this says is that the difference in pressure is equal to rho g times the difference in height. So h2 in this case, if we draw our standard coordinate system, y1 is, uh, so y2 is going to be less than y1, so this number is negative, and that tells us that the pressure here is less than, so P1 is less than P2. Now, a few things to point out. This is the difference in pressure. Um, so, that's not that, what you're measuring is the difference in pressure, not the actual total pressure. So if you want to consider the total pressure, which the book calls P abs, that's going to be um, the atmospheric pressure that is equal to P1 in this case, plus what you, um, what you measure, P1 minus P2. So this will equal the P2, the total pressure. And that is going to be equal to rho g times the height of the water. So this, this, is, um, this term is called the gauge pressure. The gauge pressure is what you measure. And it's important to keep in mind and that the gauge pressure is that the total pressure is the gauge pressure plus the atmospheric pressure. So there are a few problems where it, it points out the distinction. It says, you know, you're given the gauge pressure. It might just be one word. It doesn't say, oh, hey, don't lose track of this, but you're not actually given the total pressure. You're given the gauge pressure. You will be slightly off in your answers if you do not take into account that what you directly measure is the difference in pressure from the atmosphere, atmospheric pressure, not the total pressure. All right, so then um, you can, if you then, because what you're actually measuring is the difference in pressure, if, for instance, you connect, uh, if you connect a manometer to the, a, a system which is under vacuum, so here this is a jar of peanuts um, where it's been evacuated so the, the, the peanuts stay fresh, you would measure a negative gauge pressure. Now, you can't have a negative pressure um, because you can't have a negative force, but that just means you're you can have a negative gauge pressure, which just means that the, that the pressure on whatever you're measuring is less than the atmospheric pressure. And here, you know, this, is, this works on the same principle. Um, in a mercury barometer, <laughs> then you have no, uh, you usually have no air up at the top here. So uh, you can actually, as the mercury falls, it will evacuate part of the tube. Um, and it falls until the atmospheric pressure uh, on the mercury in the open container pushes back and pushes the, and, and balances the, the weight of the mercury at the tube. So then, the, the pressure that you would measure in that case, because P2, so we had gotten that the gauge pressure was P1 minus P2, in that case, you are setting P2 equal to zero. So in that case, your gauge pressure is actually the atmospheric pressure.
And here, so here you can see if you have two different, two liquids of different densities. So you could take your oil and your water and um, let's say this is oil, or this is water, this is oil. You put a little oil on so part of it. You will actually get different heights of fluids. Um, and the difference in the heights of the columns of fluid, um, you could actually figure out depending on the density. We will start with Bernoulli's equation, P1 plus 1 half rho V squared, rho 1 V squared, uh, plus rho 1 G, and this would be a 1, G Y 1. I'm not putting a subscript on G because G is the same the exact same equation with twos. If you're doing a Bernoulli's equation problem, I recommend starting out by just writing this um, whole mess down. Sometimes you can be a little clever and cancel stuff out from the very beginning, but when you're new at this, you're more likely to make a mistake if you try to be overly clever. So I would recommend just starting out by writing out the whole thing. All right, now, the atmospheric pressure on both sides is roughly the same. Now, strictly speaking, the atmospheric pressure changes with elevation, so there will be an ever so slight difference in pressure on this side versus that side because the atmospheric pressure changes with height. That said, that's negligible when you're talking about meters of difference in height. If you get to where you're talking about kilometers, then you have to, you have to worry about it. Okay, so then you're, we're assuming that your atmospheric pressure is the same on both sides. And we do not have any, um, we, don't, we aren't, don't have a fluid which is moving, so these terms are zero. So we get that rho one g y one equals rho 2 g y 2. And then we can rewrite this y1 minus y2 uh, actually I can well there's a few different ways. The probably easiest is y1 over y2 equals row two over row one. So if, as is drawn, y2 is, we can, so if, if y2 is greater than y1, then y1, then row one has to be greater than row two in order to compensate. And that sort of follows what you might guess that like this thing's got to be lighter than this height of fluid has to be lighter than that height of fluid. So your basic procedure when you think you have a Bernoulli's um, equation problem, start writing out Bernoulli's equations, put subscripts on everything and start looking for places where it can cancel out. Now let's just do a quick off the cuff calculation. We are going to, so we did the exercise with a scuba diver and asked how high, how, um, how deep does a scuba diver have to go to have the pressure um, increase by one atmosphere. So the pressure doubles from at one atmosphere to two atmospheres because the water adds an extra atmosphere. Let's ask how high you have to go um, in the atmosphere to half the pressure. So we will start with P1 plus one half rho V squared and rho of air is about 1.3 kilograms per meter cubed. And we'll start with subscripts because it's safer that way. If you start with subscripts, you're going to at least be meticulously aware of 
every single assumption that you are making. Now that may matter less for intro physics problems than when you go out into the, to the world and you start using your physics skills to calculate real world quantities. Often where we get ourselves in trouble is that we lose track of the assumptions that we made. So if you form good habits now, later on you're going to be able to be very clear about what assumptions you made. All right, so we consider similar case, but now you're going to go up in a hot air balloon and how high you have to go in order for the pressure to be decreased to half of what it is. Okay, so we're talking about atmospheric pressure. Um, so now we're only considering the change in the density of the atmosphere. We don't have an external pressure from anything other than the atmosphere. So our external pressure is going to be zero. And we don't have the fluid moving. So um, we have, uh, actually, never mind. I'm going to, I actually wanted to leave those as P1 and P2 because I want to calculate the, the difference between, between P1 and P2. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave these guys here. And then the density is the same. So I'm going to cancel out my subscripts for the density. And I get that P1 minus P2 is equal to rho G Y2 minus Y1. And I have said that I want my change in pressure to be half a bar, or roughly half an atmosphere. We'll go with half a bar because it makes nice round even numbers, and I don't have to worry about rounding, rounding error. All right. I don't have to plug the numbers in a calculator. Good enough for this, this calculation. So then y2 minus y1 is equal to P1 minus P2 over, and in here, this is P1, because this is the bottom, and this is P2, over rho G. So this is 1 half times 10 to the fifth, and this is 1.3, and this is 9.8. We are going to round so we don't have to use a calculator and approximate this to be 10. So when we do that, this is 5 times 10 to the third. And I've used SI units, so this works out to have units of meters. So I have to go 5 kilometers up in the air to decrease my pressure by one half. In contrast, to increase my pressure by a, a factor of two, when I am scuba diving, I only have to go 10 meters. Air is much, more, uh, is much lighter than water, and the changes in pressure are much slower if you're going up and down in the atmosphere versus if you're going up and down while scuba diving. Sometimes it's good, it, well, it's often good to go do these quick back of the envelope calculations, figure out what the consequences of these physics equations are. Um, and actually, I love, I love Bernoulli's equation because Bernoulli's equation, uh, it, it can tell you all sorts of things that are going on in the world. Like when you, uh, if you're riding your bike around, I like to ride my bike to work. So if I'm riding my bike to work and a big semi truck passes by, um, why is there a, why does I, do I feel like I'm being sucked in? Um, that's because moving air leads to a change in pressure. Bernoulli's equation comes up over and over again. All right, and then we can consider, so here this is more of the, the same considering the change in pressure when the fluid is compressed. 
uh, here, you can consider how, you can ask the question, how much is the fluid compressed when you add a mass? So, P1 plus 1 half rho 1 V1 squared plus rho 1 G Y1 equals P2 plus 1 half rho 2 V2 squared plus rho 1 G Y2. Here, we do not have the fluid moving, so we do not need to consider these terms. We have the same fluid throughout, so we do not need to change the, um, we do not need to, um, we don't need to change the subscript. P1 minus P2 is equal to rho g y2 minus y1. Now, the change in pressure is all due to the mass. So the change in pressure has to be mg over the area. So the height is equal to, uh, and this is the area of the entire fluid, not the area of just the mass. So then you can calculate how much the fluid should compress in response to, the, uh, to putting a mass on top of that cylinder. All right. And we move on to the buoyant force. Now the buoyant force is not a real force. It is an apparent force. And this is what, uh, this is what causes you to float in water. Um, but it's really a difference between the, um, it's a difference between the pressure from the, the water below you and, uh, and from, the, um, from your own weight and the, uh, the, and the pressure from the, uh, from the water above you, which is pushing down on you. So it's not, it's not a real force, but it is an apparent force. Um, so if you have, um, for instance, pressure, when you have a pressurized tire, the, the air is pushing in all directions, so it tends to push out of the tire, because in this case, the tire is, uh, the tire is under greater pressure than the air outside. So it's pushing on the surface equally. It's always pushing perpendicular to the surface. When you are underwater, you, uh, you are being pushed on and you're being pushed on from the water below you as well as from the water above you. But the water below you is pushing more, um, is pushing on you more than the, uh, than the water above you. So, uh, what you see is that even when you have objects that completely sink, they're at least partially supported because they, uh, because of the buoyant force. That uh, even if it's not enough to make the object float, it is not. Uh, there is some force from the pressure in the water. Um, and submarines, for instance, have a adjustable density, so they have ballast tanks so that they can float or sink as desired. They're changing their density. Um, what happens is that an object will sink if it is in a fluid which has a greater, uh, which has a lower density than the object, and it will float if it has if, if it is in a fluid which has a greater density than the object. So here, if you have helium-filled balloons, helium balloons have a lower density because helium is so light than the air around them, so they are they float because of the buoyant force. So here you can see uh, how this works is that you have pressure due to the weight of the fluid, which increases with depth. Um, and this, there's a change in pressure um, through the object. And then because there is a change in pressure with the height of the, um, with the, height of the fluid, the pressure is greater here than it is than it is there, so there is a net upward force because the pressure is greater as you're um, at a lower point in the fluid. Um, so, if you uh, the the 
buoyant force, if the, the object is experiences a buoyant force which is greater than the weight of the object, the object floats. If the buoyant force is less than the weight of the object, the object sinks. Um, and the weight of the object, so the if the object is removed, it, it is replaced by fluid having a weight WB. Um, so the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. And this is the important part to remember because there's not some uh, you often have to look at the, the geometry of the situation and work out what exactly the buoyant force is. It's not a constant equation. It's the weight of the object which was displaced. So for instance, if you have a boat sitting in the water, um, the boat does not go completely under the water. The volume of... so. The, if you take, know this volume, the volume which is underneath the surface of the water, the, uh, the volume of the boat displaced is, times the density of water is equal to the weight of the water displaced. So is, is equal to the mass of the water displaced. So you would have to calculate, you'd have to know in that case that the boat is not all the way submerged. Um, whereas if you have a person entirely underwater, um, then you know how much of their volume is, uh, you know that their full volume is submerged. So you know, the, if you know, you know that the um, weight of the, that the strength of the buoyant force has to equal the weight of the water equal to an area of that person. But there's not one pat equation that you can write all the time. So here you see uh, a couple of pictures. So a ship floats higher in the water if it is a, an unloaded ship floats higher in the water than the loaded ship. Um, so we can say if we will approximate the boat as a square because we're physicists, so we can. Um, and then here you have some height of the height of water displaced. So uh, if you have a loaded ship, then so if the ship has a mass m, if it's unloaded and you add some mass, some cargo to it with a mass capital M, then you're going to, to compensate for the added mass. The ship is going to sink because you need more water. Um, it, here you have an equilibrium problem because your two forces, your two forces are the weight of the ship and the buoyant force. So you know the weight of the ship, the ship is m plus m g and this has to equal the mass of the water displaced. So this is going to equal rho times the um, volume of the ship, which is the area times the height times g. So then so where I got this, so this is mass over volume times volume. Um, and so this is the mass of the water times the gravitational force. So then you can see your, let's see, we have our Gs cancel out on each side. And the height is equal to the mass divided by the density times the area. So if your, uh, the height of water submerged, so if your mass increases, the boat sinks. And we got, we can calculate how much using the fact that the water, um, the mass of the water displaced is uh, times the gravitational constant is equal to the, the value of the buoyant force. You can actually use this to measure, um, to measure densities. 
So you can weigh a coin in air, and then you hold up a beaker that has some, um, some liquid of known density, and what happens is that the mass of the coin is going to change. Using that, uh, that difference, you can actually uh, calculate because... Um, when you, when you submerge the coin, you have this added buoyant force, and what you're going to measure is the tension on the string, um, not the total weight. So then you're, measuring the, then you're measuring indirectly the buoyant force, which is, in fact, dependent on the density. All right, now we can move to fluid dynamics. Um, and... We will start with um, the continuity equation. So if you have pipes and you have a big pipe moving into a small pipe and you have flow through both of, flow of some fluid through both of these, um, you have to have the same, if you are in an equilibrium, situation, then the flow of matter through both of these pipes has to equal. So if we have, uh, your book uses a flow rate Q for uh, the um, mass per unit volume cubed. So if we have a flow rate dQ dt, now, um, the volume that you move in a small amount of time, t, is going to equal to the velocity. Um, so this width is the velocity times time, and then this is the area. So you get that the... Um, or sorry, the velocity times some small unit time. So your small unit of flow is equal to the area times the velocity times a small unit of time or delta Q delta T is equal to the area times the velocity. So this is the amount of, and then you then you take the limit as delta t becomes, uh, approaches zero, and you get the derivative. So you get that the derivative of the, that the rate of, the rate of flow per unit time is equal to the area times the velocity. Now you gotta have the same amount of stuff that going out as you go in, if you are in, in an equilibrium, um, if you are in an equilibrium. So you then get that the area times the velocity um, here has to equal the area times the velocity there. What that means is that if this number, if this area is larger than this area, then this velocity has to be larger than that velocity. So if you cram a fluid into a smaller pipe, it's going to speed up because you got to get the same amount of stuff through per unit time and the, the area is smaller. Um, so here you can, um, these, these speeds can be relevant if you consider things like uh, a hurricane, um, if you have, uh, it, if you are moving the same amount of stuff through the, a smaller place, like through the, the eye, the eye of the storm is smaller, so you get the, lo the largest wind speeds closer to, to the eye and the smallest um, wind speeds further away. All right, and then we, we start to worry about what, um, how the, uh, the material is moving through. So you can have, there are two types of flow. There's laminar flow and turbulent flow. Laminar flow is nice and smooth. Um, it, 
what happens in laminar flow is that the different layers of fluid are all going in the same direction and parallel to each other. And if you had a fluid that had no viscosity, they would all be moving through at the same rate. With a finite velocity, it actually turns out that the, um, the liquid at the center moves faster than the liquid at the, um, at the edges. Turbulent flow is when you do not have these nice, neat layers, but you have vortices, you have swirls. Um, things are much more chaotic. Um, it's much more irregular. Ah, and this is, this is the derivation that we just went through on the fly for the, the rate of flow. Um, all right, and this shows what happens if you have the tube narrowing, that the tube, the, the wider tube uh, has the same amount of stuff going through it. So the faster, the narrower tube has to have stuff going through faster. Um, and then we can get to uh, more applications of Bernoulli's equation. So here, um, you can see um, what happens if, say, you have a car, a truck speeding by a car. Um, because you have, because the air between the two of them is moving, you actually end up getting a decrease in pressure. And this is called the Bernoulli effect. Um, so if you have, um, if you have cars passing, cars and trucks passing each other on the, on a road, then you get a decrease in pressure. Let's look at Bernoulli's equation to show this. So the atmospheric, so you have differences you have a P1 plus 1 half rho 1 V1 squared plus rho uh, G, or rho 1 G Y1 equals P2 plus 1 half rho 2 V2 squared plus rho 2 G Y2. Now I'm going to make my simplifications. I have the same fluid throughout because I'm talking about air. So I'm going to delete, I'm going to remove the subscript so that I, I have one constant density. And I am dealing with everything at the same height. If you're talking about cars on a highway, you do not have um, radically different heights. So, uh, so these terms are we're going to set to zero because there's no difference in height. We're just going to set our y-axis equal to zero at the ground. So then you can uh, simplify this and say that pressure one minus pressure two, the difference we will call this side pressure one and this side is pressure two, is equal to one half rho v2 squared minus v1 squared. So now we have a difference in airspeed uh, outside, uh, on one side of the, the vehicles and on this, the area between them, where the air is actually traveling faster between the vehicles. So this number is larger. That means that uh, if this number is larger, that means this difference is positive. This pressure is larger than that pressure. Now, if this pressure is larger than that pressure, that means the pressure on, that means, so the pressure is the force per unit area. So if I have, if I want to consider the force on a car, the force on the car going in is the pressure from the outside times the area of the car and the force on the um, on the car going uh, the force on the car from the air here going out is the pressure between the cars times the area so this is the area times what I have called p1 minus p Two, so the force is positive. We have a 
larger pressure here, a larger force in this direction from the air outside the car than from the air inside the car. The car feels like it is pushed towards the truck because of the Bernoulli effect. Now this happens anytime you have, um, you have any fluid moving. So for instance, when you take a shower and there, there is water falling from the shower head, that moves the air along with it. So you have water moving, you have air moving inside the shower, whereas outside of the shower, the air is, ha, is not moving. The velocity is approximately zero. That means that there is a greater pressure outside of the shower than inside the shower. It pushes the shower curtain towards you. Um, Bernoulli's effect. And this is also why when I am riding my bicycle to work and I am passed by a large truck, even if they don't actually hit me, I feel like I am being pulled in towards the truck. That's another reason why when you drive by uh, construction workers on the interstate, you need to slow down. Notice that it goes with the velocity squared. So the faster you're going, it, the, the pressure, the, the pressure difference, and therefore the force on that construction worker as you drive by goes with your velocity squared. You don't actually have to hit the construction worker to knock them over. All right. And here you can use, this is an example of how you can derive Bernoulli's equation and you can use the, um, the force uh, on this segment of the pipe versus that segment of the pipe. So you get the pressure going that way um, compared to the pressure going the other way. This is your kinetic energy term. And this is, um, this is from the change in potential energy. All right, so now you can we can talk about different experimental apparatuses that you can use in or that you can use that use um, Bernoulli's equation or that you can explain with Bernoulli's equation. So for instance, if you have a Bunsen burner, um, you have an adjustable gas nozzle, you allow air in, it sucks the, it helps you suck the natural, get, suck the gas out through the Bunsen burner so you can light it on fire. Um, if you have a, so in a um, perfume bottle, you can squeeze air through a bulb that gets the air moving above the, uh, above the surface of the perfume that decreases the pressure here relative to over here and it sucks the perfume up into the nozzle so that it comes out of the nozzle. Um, you can uh, use an aspirator, which uses high, uh, a high-speed stream of water to create a region of lower pressure, um, and then that can then be a that can help you um, make a suction cup um, for uh, for different medical applications as well as draining a basement stuff like that. Um, and you also can, um, you have a chimney and a hot water heater, um, and if you get, uh, if you get air going into the pipe, that helps suck the, the water, um, from the hot water heater up through the pipe. All right, so you actually can use Bernoulli's principle to measure the speed of uh, to measure the speed of fluids. Um, so here are a couple of devices. Uh, these are manometers or things that measure pressure. Um, and you have two tubes. They either can be you, you can have two designs, either that they are separated by height or that one of them is inside of the other. Um, and if, and then you can either have, so if you have this one inside, then um, you can have this closed off as well. <clears throat> and then because of the, um, <coughs> if you have this tube closed off, you know that the velocity here is zero. Um, so that sets this term equal to zero and you have some change in height and that lets you measure the change in pressure.
uh, sorry, you have change, if you have these at the same pressure, then uh, it lets you measure the um, speed of the, the speed of the fluid. Um, and then you can think about what happens if, say, you have a fire hose. So here, if you have a fire truck and you have a hose that, uh, that goes all the way up the ladder and it's 10 meters, remember that when we calculated how much a change of, in it, how much the pressure changed in the ocean, 10 meters of ocean water led to a whole atmosphere increase in pressure. Um, if you have to have, a, so changes can happen rather quickly over 10 meters especially if you're talking about dense fluids like water. So now you have, uh, if you have a hose going up the, um, up to the top of a building, it actually loses, um, it loses, um, it loses energy by the time that it gets up to the top. So here you can, uh, if you take, this equation, we're going to do the same thing. P1 plus 1 half rho V1 squared. It's all water. We're just going to not have the subscript on water here. We know that the heights are different. Um, and equals P2 plus 1 half rho V2 plus rho g y 2. So here we have the difference in heights fixed. And um, if you have water coming out, um, the pressure, so you end up with the pressure in the, the pressure in both cases on either side of the fluid is going to be atmospheric pressure. But if you go to, if you have the, the nozzle at the ground versus at the, the top, you're changing the height, so you're changing the speed. And the difference in, so if you're comparing when the hose is on the ground versus the hose being on the top of the building, atmospheric pressure is the same. So your change in velocity Well, you're actually, you can calculate the change in the velocity squared. So the change in velocity squared is proportional to the difference in the heights. So now, if the, this height is larger than that height, so this is 0.2 and this is 0.1, ah, then this is larger than that, this is positive then, so the velocity is higher down here than up there. You also can change, you can change the velocity by having the nozzle. So it's, if you had to consider that what the nozzle does, you should consider that two stages because you're also going from the velocity inside the hose, which is wider, to the velocity inside the nozzle. Now, I mentioned the difference between uh, laminar and, uh, and turbulent flow. Um, so you can calculate the, um, there's a couple equations here. This gives, this equation here gives the Reynolds number. The, this is, so two times the density times the speed of the fluid, um, and then times the, uh, the radius of the pipe divided by the viscosity. That is the Reynolds number. For a Reynolds number, which is less than about 2,000, you have laminar flow. And 
for a Reynolds number which is greater than about 2,000, then you have turbulent flow. So one of the classes of problems in this chapter is to calculate, to look at different fluids and calculate whether you have laminar or turbulent flow. So laminar flow occurs when you do not have mixing between layers because the, the different layers of fluid um, are, it's as if they were sheets on top of each other. Now you can have different speeds in laminar flow. Not all of the sheets have to go at the same speed, but you can think of it as different sheets of, of fluid moving on top of each other. Turbulent flow means that you get all sorts of vortices and eddies and you get mixing. Um, so turbulent flow, uh, turbulent flow tends to mix things up a lot more um, and it's a little less predictable. Um, if you have an obstruction, you tend to get turbulent flow. That's because as soon as you have an obstruction, you are narrowing the pipe. And when you narrow the pipe, then you are, um, then you have to get greater speeds traveling at the same, the fluid has to travel at greater speeds to go through that obstruction. You can measure viscosity um, for laminar, using laminar flow of fluid between two plates um, that each have the same area. So uh, you have a height of fluid L and then you drag the plates across with a given, you know, you measure or you apply a certain force and you measure how, uh, you can measure the, um, the speed that that force causes um, the, the plate to move and that lets you measure the viscosity. Um, if the fluid in flow in a tube has negligible resistance, then the speed's gonna be across, the same across the, sa across the tube. This is if you have a non-viscous fluid. If you have a viscous fluid, then the, um, if you look across the cross section of the tube, you're going to have stuff moves slower closer to the wall and faster towards the center. That's because closer to the wall, it's sticking to the wall, it's interacting with the wall, it's, it's moving and it's having more interactions here. Um, and that actually, inform, that actually is what drives the shape of a Bunsen burner flame because there is some profile of the gas, uh, the velocity profile of the gas as you go through the tube. Um, and here, um, Poisset's, I think it's pronounced Poisset, my French pronunci pronunciation is terrible, um, but so Poisset's law uh, it tells you the speed in, the, sorry, the rate of flow in a tube given a certain viscosity, um, given the fact that, that um, the speed of, uh, of the flow fluid as you look through the tube is going to change. Now we're gonna work through some sample problems or at least talk about them. So here you can see a glass, an a glass of ice water. It's filled to the brim. Will the water overflow when the glass, the ice melts? Now this is really important. For the vast majority of solids, the density is um, the density of the solid is less than the density of the liquid. So liquids tend to be larger. Um, it for most materials because when you have a solid you have atoms and molecules packed together as tightly as possible. A counter example is water. The density of ice is actually less than the density of water, of liquid water. That is why ice floats. And you know that you actually, even if you didn't know it before, you could have determined that water has a lower density than, or sorry, ice has a lower density than water because ice floats. That turns out to have major consequences for life on Earth because ice, when the when lakes and rivers freeze, lake, lakes, rivers, uh, parts of the ocean freeze, ice floats instead of sinking. If it sank, then you would probably end up with the entire ocean freeze, starting to freeze because the the, when it froze, water would sink, and then the new water would be exposed to the cold air that froze the old water. 
Um, so the fact that ice floats is a, because it has a lower density than water is a big thing. And at least if you're in my class, I'm going to ask you about it. Um, now this shows how, uh, so this shows how a levee works. So if you have a river which uh, is flooding, when you pile up sandbags, you don't actually need the sandbags to, so if you have a river which, which is flooding, you can get water coming underneath the levee because of the water pressure, um, because of the pressure down here at the bottom of the levee. So if water is actually seeping through the sand below the levee, how do you stop it? You can pile up sandbags. Now, the, the water that is pushed out from underneath the, the levee is going to come up into the sandbags and seep through the sandbags until it reaches the same height as the flooding river. So this is how you can stop, um, you can stop the water um, from going underneath the levee. All right, here's a question. You have an old rubber boot. It has two leaks. They're not the most visible here. Leak one has, it points this way, so you get water flowing in this direction. At roughly the same height, you have leak two, which points up a little bit. And what is the maximum height, height that water can squirt from leak one? How does the velocity of water emerging from leak two different from, differ from that of leak one? Okay, so, so because these both are at the same height, so we can actually start by writing down our friendly equation, Bernoulli's equation, P1 plus one half rho V1 squared plus rho gy1, and then the same thing for the other side. Now, don't ask me why, if you had a leaky old boot, you would actually fill it with water. Um, but hey, we're just going to solve the problem. Okay, so now if you have these two leaks, the pressure on either side is the same because they're at the same height and they're both exposed to the air, so the pressure is the same. Uh, then the question is what happened, and we are going to, the heights are about the same, so these terms are zero. And from this we can conclude that the velocity out of both sides of the boot exactly when it leaves is the same. So then what happens to the velocity after it leaves the boot? Well, in this case, the, the water is going to shoot up and it will reach some, depending on its velocity, it'll reach some maximum velocity and then squirt down. And this, the, um, the water in this case is going to come, it's going to, it's getting squirted straight out. So here the water is going to go slower at first, and then it's going to go, uh, it's going to shoot up and go back down, and then it's going to be at uh, about the same speed when it hits the ground as here. Because they both have the same velocity coming out of the boot, but in one case the water shoots up and then go, lands back down on the ground. And here's an example relevant to laminar flow. If you have a sink drain, they often have something that looks like this. This actually acts to, uh, what this does is it then slows the, um, it slows the water down. It tends to, it tries to make the water sit and run through laminar sheets so that it, it runs through sheets, so it runs parallel to each other so that it actually, you get laminar flow instead of turbulent flow. Uh, all right, a dam is used to hold back a river. The dam has a height h and a width w. <clears throat> Assume that the density of water is one gram per centimeter cubed. What is the net force on the dam? And why does the thickness of the dam increase with depth? Well, the thickness of the dam increases with depth 
because the, um, because the force is greater down here. Now, to solve this one, so if you are still chugging through calculus, you may not be able to follow all of that. That's okay. So we're going to start, because we're going to have to use calculus to do this. So we're going to start with the pressure due to a height of fluid is rho times m times the height of the fluid above it. So this goes like mgh. Uh, let's see. Sorry, hang on. Rho gh. I wrote the wrong equation down. So our pressure goes like rho gh. So now um, our force is going to equal the pressure times the area. Um, and we have, um, we're going to look at a small segment of area. So a small segment of force, Vf is the pressure, and I'm going to draw my coordinate system. So I'm going to put y0 up here. So this is the y-axis. And then I am going to integrate from y equals 0 to y equals h. But notice I've flipped my, uh, the orientation of my y-axis so that y is positive going down. So when I write this, my pressure at any given point is rho g times y, the pressure due to the fluid. Um, and we're going to neglect atmospheric pressure um, and just stick with the, the pressure due to the fluid. So then my pressure is rho gy. And then my small segment of area is going, let's see, it has a height h and a width w. <clears throat> so my small little strip, as drawn here on the figure, has an area w dy. So then, my force is going to be the integral of all of these little forces, which is going to be the integral from 0 to h, I'm sorry, 0 to capital H, the way this is drawn. Uh, and then rho g y w d y. These things are all constant, so I can pull them outside of my integral. And I get rho g w integral from 0 to h of y d y, which is equal to rho g w h squared over 2. Now, the way that this problem is drawn, it is actually suggesting that you put your y at 0, and then um, you would integrate from 0 to capital H. But if you do that, then your equation for the density is slightly trickier. If you were to do that, your equation for the density instead would be rho g and then h minus y. So that if you are at a height of h, you have no fluid above you, and if you are at a height of um, if you are at a height of zero, you have all of the fluid above you. I chose to draw a more convenient coordinate system. If the problem just asks you for the final answer, then um, then you don't need um, then you don't necessarily need to use the coordinate system in drawn and suggested by the problem. That said, usually physics textbooks suggest that you use certain coordinate systems for a reason. Sometimes if you get too creative, you can end up with an awful lot of ugly algebra. 
All right. Here, a container of water has a, cro has a certain cross-sectional area. A piston sits on top of the water. Um, there's a spout located half a meter from the bottom of the tank, open to the atmosphere, and a stream of water exits the spout. Um, given the cross-sectional area, um, you're given the cross-sectional area of the spout. What is the velocity of the water as it leaves the spout? If the opening of the spout is located one and a half meters above the ground, ah, 0.5, this should actually be 0.15 meters above the ground, how far from the spout does the water hit the floor? All right, so this is a Bernoulli's, well, the first part is a Bernoulli's equation problem. You start with, so you're asked to figure out the velocity of the water as it leaves the spout. So the pressure, um, we'll start with P1 plus 1 half rho B1 squared plus rho GH. equals P2 plus one half rho V2 squared plus rho VH2. Okay, so now we will calculate, uh, we know that the pressure here is atmospheric, so here this will be our point one. And the pressure at one is going to be the atmospheric pressure plus the mg, the force of the mass, divided by the cross section, the, the air cross sectional area of the um, the container of water. So that's the area at point, the pressure at point one. Um, and here we're going to, uh, so we have this, the, <clears throat> so we have this added pressure outside of the container. And then, let's see, inside of the container, we have nothing. We're not going to have moving, uh, the water's not moving inside the container. Uh, and here we ask at the, so we will have, we'll set this guy equal to zero. So exactly at the edge, there's no water sitting on top of it. And we just have to consider the pressure from the atmospheric pressure and the pressure of the mass. And then we have no external pressures here. So the only pressure that we, extra pressure that we have down here at the spout is due to the, um, due to the height of fluid above the, um, above the spout. So then um, you can calculate that P atmosphere plus mg over a is equal, well, let's see, and then we'll do, now we need the height of water above that point. Um, so our h2 is going to be the total height minus the height of the spigot. So we have minus rho G H minus capital H minus little h equals one half rho V2 squared. So you can solve for the velocity coming out of that spigot. Let's do a couple cross checks. If, um, if we have, uh, if we're at the very top, ah, do I want, I think I need, to, I should not have made this guy zero because the, the we also have atmosphere, yes, we also have atmospheric pressure here. The pressure on this side 
pushing, trying to push it back into the tube is zero. So that means that we end up with no atmospheric pressure here. The difference in pressure um, here versus right here is only due to that added mass. So if you, um, if you remove the mass, the only difference in pressure that you have is due to the height of the water. And that alone is going to cause uh, the water to squirt out. And then if you set the height of the water equal to the height of the spigot, then you will still get a tiny bit of, you will still get water squeezing out because you have the mass pressing down. And if you set the lowest height to zero, then you should actually get, let's see, the, yeah, you want this one, that height should increase. I have a, I should have a sign error um, because it's the, yeah, ah, this, let's see, this should be the height of the column of water and that should generally increase the pressure, which will increase the velocity. So here I have a sign error. Um, so this, so then you would take this velocity of water, and then from there it's a kinematic equation problem where you just calculate um, it shoots out how where does it land given the initial velocity. So this is one of those cases where you have a physics problem that's a two-stage problem. So you have to do you have to start putting all of your pieces back together because that kinematic um, solving a kinematic problem reaches back to some of the first couple chapters. All right, here a fluid of constant density flows through a reduction um, in a pipe. Find the equation for the change of the change in pressure. Um, so okay, now we have to use our continuity equation. So we have A1V1 equals A2 V2. Um, and now we have P, we write down Bernoulli's equation. We're gonna have no change in height. So these terms go to zero and we can calculate, so you, uh, we can calculate the velocity of, so we need the change in pressure, P1 minus P2 equals one half rho V1 squared minus V2 squared. Here I'm going to eliminate V2. V2 equals A1 over A2 V1. So this is equal to one half rho V1 squared times 1 minus A1 over A2 quantity squared. So if you have, uh, let's see, here the velocity of 1 should be less than the velocity of 2. Um, so this should be negative. And that, and indeed, if A1 is larger then A2, you're going to get a very large negative, you're going to get a large negative number here. And that tells you that P2 is greater than P1. The, so the pressure in the fluid right here is larger than the pressure in the fluid right there.
All right. Hopefully you're beginning to feel much more comfortable with this. Most of the time, the answer is Bernoulli's equation. Okay, two pipes of equal and constant diameter leave, wa leave a water pumping station and dump water out of an open end that is open to the atmosphere. The water enters at a pressure of two atmospheres and a speed of, and, and you're given the speed. One pipe, uh, the speed is one meter per second. What is the velocity of water as it leaves each pipe? Okay, and so here, so what's the velocity as it leaves each pipe? So here, if, and I think the, the figure intends that you would um, treat this as, um, as if it were the same height roughly as that. Okay, so as usual, we can start by writing down Bernoulli's equation. We have P1 plus 1 half rho, here we've got the same density, V1 squared plus uh, M, uh, I keep wanting to put an M in there, plus rho G H1 equals P2 plus 1 half rho V2 squared plus rho G H2. And now, um, if we consider the first part, uh, let's see. We are just considering the speed here and not yet. So we have the speed here and the pressure here. We are after, and we know the pressure here, and we want to know the speed here. We do not have a decrease in height, so we can set these terms equal to zero. And uh, we are given the pressure, uh, and we can calculate V2, so the, the speed, the velocity. So P1 minus P2 plus 1 half rho v1 squared equals 1 half rho v2 squared. And then we divide through by rho over 2, and we get p1 minus p2 times 2 over rho plus v1 squared equals v2 squared. So that tells us the speed, the first speed. And if we do the second speed, we actually can make just a minor tweak. Instead of making this term go, we're going to, instead of making this term go to zero, I'm going to change my twos to threes. We'll delete this part because that's going to be a big change. And otherwise, I'm going to set these equal to 3. And now I have here, um, I have a rho g, a minus a rho g h because I've got a drop. So then I get P1 minus P3 plus 1 half rho V1 squared uh, plus rho G H equals 1 half rho V3 squared P1 minus P3 times 2 divided by rho plus 2gh equals, or sorry, and then I have to have a 
plus v1 squared equals v3 squared. So what I'm doing either way is I'm starting with Bernoulli's equation. I start writing down what I know and try to be very meticulous so I don't make those terrible, stupid mistakes, which everybody makes. And then I can start plugging through the equations to solve for whatever I was asked to solve for. And with that, we're going to end this chapter, and I'll see you guys for the next one.